When astronauts first set foot on the moon in July of 1969, the live television coverage was at the time the most watched live program in television history. NASA's Artemis program aims to meet a White House directive to land boots on the moon by 2024. That leaves little time to design, test, and fly the components that will allow the world to watch live the first woman and the next man to set foot on the moon. So we're gonna now begin our next session, which is Mission Critical, Mission Critical Project Artemis, Imaging from the Moon and Deep Space. Our presenters are NASA's International States Space Station Communication Manager, Dylan Mathis, and NASA Imagery Experts Project Manager, Rodney Grubbs. Now, just about a month ago, I did mention I went to Huntsville. I got to meet Rodney out at the Redstone Arsenal and see the control room with the International Space Station feed coming through and discovered that he has a silver Snoopy. And I just learned that Dylan also has a silver Snoopy. And this is one of the most prestigious rewards that uh, you can receive. Only 1% only 1% of the eligible candidates for this award actually receive it. You can only receive once in a lifetime, and you can only receive it from an astronaut. So congratulations. We have a very, uh, this is an exceptional group we're having up here. So please welcome them to the stage. Question for you. How many people are in space right now? Ten. More than one. <laughs> oh, that was good. More than one. We had 10. Right now, we've got six people on the International Space Station. We have been with, with constant crew on the International Space Station for the last 19 years, going on 20 years of permanent human presence in low Earth orbit, orbiting around the Earth. And on there, we're doing science that we can't do anywhere else, and we're also doing things that are helping us go to, back to the moon. And it is a, the ISS is a proving ground for that. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Rodney Grubbs. All right, so uh, I was asked today to talk about our return to the moon and the challenges that we face for doing imagery from uh, when we go back to the moon. But I, I want to step back a little bit and be a little philosophical for a moment and just talk about the importance of imagery in general and, um, and discuss a little bit about why we have cameras in these environments in the first place. So uh, many people consider this image uh, taken from Apollo 8 one of the most important photographs ever taken. Uh, most of you have probably seen the, the full image of this. This is the famous Earthrise from Apollo 8. And it was taken at the end of a very tumultuous year, 1968. Uh, assassinations and war and all of these things going on uh, uh, back here on planet Earth. And yet we took an exploration to the moon and three explorers were in a small spacecraft and they saw the Earth rise for the first time and grabbed a camera and, and shot this photograph. And it's just a reminder that, you know, in spite of all of the politics and, and everything else going on, we all are really uh, in a precarious situation sitting on this one rock out in space. And it's a camera and an image and a person behind the camera that brought us uh, this. Now, NASA actually uh, usually has cameras for engineering purposes, uh, to see what's going on with the spacecraft, for situational awareness, those kinds of things. Uh, but it, it's the pictures that the, and the video and imagery that the astronauts take, uh, sometimes it can be much more poignant than they think at the time. Uh, there's a purpose for this photograph to, to uh, verify the performance of the vehicle. But think about this for a second. When this photograph was taken, Everyone that had ever lived and everybody alive at the time, except for Michael Collins, is represented in this photograph. Makes Michael Collins at that moment a pretty lonely person if you think about it, but uh, there's just something poignant about that fact that you've got Buzz and Neil in that spacecraft right there and all the rest of us back on that rock in the background and just Michael Collins behind that photograph. So uh, as, we, as we talk about and think about uh, cameras going back to the moon, let's just also remember that um, we can have some pretty poignant moments that are gonna be captured as we go for explorers. I mean, think about uh, Columbus and, and his expedition and the Viking expeditions before that. If we'd had uh, an image from that era, how important that would have been, that first sight of the shore as they approached the shore, for example. But as it turns out, television was an afterthought for Apollo 11. Uh, it was told to me 
by a colleague that was in the room. I, I was only probably uh, one or two at the time, so uh, I, had to, I have to go by what I'm told, that uh, they did a rundown of the plan for the Apollo 11 moon landing, and that a public affairs officer listening in to this timeline uh, raised his hand and said, uh, what about the live television? And everybody looked around at each other and said, uh, we don't have plan. We didn't have that as a requirement. So many of you may know, and you can Google it and find the story about how with Westinghouse and, and others, they very quickly uh, engineered a television camera so that we could all back here on Earth watch what was happening there. And in most documentaries, and if you saw a lot of documentaries this summer, you saw the, the very seconds that Neil uh, stepped off the limb, but there was a, a, a planning period right before that where they made sure that the television camera was working. So I thought it might be interesting if you've never seen this footage to, to listen in and hear as NASA is setting up for this, the most watched television moment in history. Houston, Roger, we copy and we're standing by for your TV. Flight like telecom, if you don't turn the TV circuit breaker in. TV circuit breaker in. Houston, uh, this is Neil, radio check. Neil, this is Houston, loud and clear. Break, break, buzz, this is Houston, uh, radio check and verify TV circuit breaker in. Capcom flight, de verify TV circuit breaker in. I mentioned it, let me check. Verified. Roger, TV circuit breaker's in. Page five, clear. Roger. And we're getting a picture on the TV. You okay. got a good picture, huh? Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and uh, currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out a fair amount of detail. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. That's one small step for man. So that was a little bit of behind the scenes of the, as they were waiting, yeah. As they were waiting to make sure the camera was working before they proceeded with their timeline. Uh, now, if I have anything to say about it, when we go back to the moon, we're gonna have a little bit better video quality than that. <laughs> Not to disparage what they pulled off in a very short period of time. Let me just be uh, clear for the record. Um, I thought it might be interesting for you to know that the voice of Capcom for the first steps on the moon was a gentleman named Bruce McCandless. Fifteen years later, he became the first human being to untether and become a spaceship all by himself. This is Bruce McCandless flying in this manned maneuvering unit, and uh, he flew some distance away from the shuttle. Um, for a variety of reasons, that, that, a, a stunt like that was not tried again for quite some time, but you'll notice there's cameras on Bruce looking back, but I've always thought this was a pretty poignant photograph of, of Bruce McCandless, the voice of Capcom on Apollo 11, floating off all by himself without a tether. And uh, needless to say, that takes uh, a great deal of um, crazy to go and do something like that. Uh, this is a uh, selfie from uh, the Mars Curiosity rover, and uh, this is a composite, to be clear. And uh, we have photoshopped out the arm of the uh, camera looking back at itself. Uh, but again, uh, you know, an image and a photograph can convey quite a bit. And it's pretty amazing uh, that with NASA's tiny budget, we can still pull off little miracles like this. And we're going to come back to curiosity here in a little bit. And of course, uh, windows are always a subject of um, much debate since the very beginning of the space program. There were discussions about uh, putting a window on the spacecraft. If any of you have seen Wright stuff, there's uh, a long scene about that. And it's very true. And those debates are continuing today for the uh, Artemis program about uh, whether or not we can put a, uh, a window on the moon. But I think it says a lot about NASA that only NASA would build a space station and put a bay window. And um, needless to say, if we were to fly uh, to the ISS, Terry talked earlier, uh, about they have a lot of work to do, but if I was up there and I had a little free time, I think I'd be sitting in the bay window uh, looking back at this Earth as well. So during the early days of human spaceflight, let's, let's segue a little bit to why we're here and what we want to talk to you about today. Uh, NASA had to pretty much invent everything or work with industry to invent what was happening. 
Uh, we made our own cameras with, with industry's help. And this is Wernerbron Braun here in the upper right, um, looking at and pointing at the uh, Apollo 11 uh, television camera, the camera that shot the video we just looked at. And then the bottom right, there's the camera uh, as it stowed uh, for uh, its flight. So as Rodney was saying, a lot of the cameras and things that were used, NASA had to invent. NASA had to make and work with companies like Westinghouse and Philco and a bunch of others to actually make the cameras from scratch. What we're trying to do on the International Space Station is something more like this. This is Don Pettit, one of the most accomplished imagery photographers, I dare to say, out of this world. Uh, with these cameras, these are all commercial off-the-shelf base cameras very, very few modifications, if any, and we're using those. And we're using this as a stepping stone, again, to go back to the moon, where we want to try to use as much commercial off the shelf as possible. Here's a shot, uh, kind of stage, that actually Terry took uh, when, he was, when he was up there several years ago. Uh, we have a red uh, digital cinema camera up there that we actually now are acquiring imagery in 8K, uh, which we're pretty proud of, and uh, it is uh, extremely, extremely gorgeous to look at. Anything else you want to say on that one? Well, the only thing I'd like to say about that is, is I, I still haven't seen it in 8K. I would like to see it in 8K sometime. Oh, wait, there has to be a monitor. That's yeah, right. That's right. Hmm. <laughs> All right, and here's a, a, some time lapse we'd like to show you um, that was recently shot. And you see the, the little bright lights there are lightning strikes that are happening. This is a, a full moon night, I believe. And this is taken with the Nikon D5 at about a frame a second and then stitch together. How fast are they going? 17,500 miles an hour. Going around the Earth 16 times a day. Pop quiz, how many people are in space? <laughs> Excellent, you made my day. Attention. <laughs> you made my day, thank you. All right, so NASA as a whole, you know, we're a bunch of nerds and we do all this engineering stuff and try to go into to space and, and push the, the bounds of what humanity has done. We've got a tremendous story, but we're not the best storytellers in the world. So that's why we've teamed with folks like IMAX. We've teamed with uh, Felix and Paul, which is a cinematic virtual reality company, um, to actually have the true storytellers tell our story. And so we've got some really exciting uh, things. Astro B, which is a free-floating um, robot, if you will, that has cameras all over it. And Rodney will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, where it actually can do surveillance with nobody uh, in a visiting space vehicle at that time. Also, we have a slightly modified Nikon camera that's outside that uh, we're actually using the video side of it the majority of the time, um, where it's on an on a old stanchion that we had. We took a, a previous pan tilt unit from another uh, older standard def camera and actually strapped on this to the top of it because pan tilt units are very expensive to certify for space, so we figured out a way to to use what we already had and try to give us a better quality image. Also takes great still images as well, but it uh, gives us some, some imagery and some angles that we haven't had uh, before. 50 years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. 
this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. Any, anybody recognize the voice and face at the end there? Gene Kranz, Gene Kranz that's right. Uh, a legend uh, for sure. So uh, is everybody ready to strap in and go back to the moon? Yeah. All right. Call your congressman. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the Artemis program. The Artemis program is the uh, program to return back to the moon. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, Vice President uh, Pence announced in Huntsville back in March that the President of the United States has ordered NASA to get boots back on the moon with the first woman and the next man by 2024. Well, uh, that's a pretty sporty um, uh, accomplishment, and we have been very, very busy working on that. It's occupied nearly all of my time um, since then. Artemis consists of several components. There's the SLS rocket, uh, which is the follow-on rocket. Um, it's a bigger rocket than uh, Saturn V when it's fully built and finished. And uh, sitting on top of that will be the Orion vehicle. Both of those programs were already in work. So uh, that's the Orion um, up at the top mated to what's called the Gateway. The Gateway is going to be an orbiting platform around the moon that will serve as our way station so that uh, instead of doing an Apollo 11 style uh, event where you throw everything away and come back with a capsule, we're gonna have a, a presence in space around the moon. Turns out that the moon is an excellent analog for a Mars mission. It's a good place to begin testing out all of the, the uh, engineering and uh, con ops and everything else involved in that's necessary uh, for a Mars mission. And it's gonna be in what's called a near rectilinear halo orbit, which goes halfway to a Lagrange point. So it'll take humans further out in space than they've ever gone before. Um, attached to this is uh, a, uh, artist's conception of what the human landing system will look like. Um, uh, compared to the Orion vehicle, which is bigger than Apollo, the human lander will be much, much bigger than the lander was for Apollo 11. Uh, it, it, there's a solicitation out on the street now, uh, and I have a link to it at the end of the presentation, where uh, NASA is asking industry for ideas and concepts for building the human lander. Um, uh, right now, we have a contract with Maxar uh, to build the power and propulsion element, and that's the first key piece that will launch and go into um, a lunar orbit in 2023. And then uh, the um, small pressurized cabin, which they now call HALO, which I believe is Human and Logistics Orbit Orbiter. Um, I may have that wrong. They've, they've changed it about 12 times since I've been working on it. We've been calling it Minihab until very recently and then a logistics module. So all of those pieces have to come together in, in uh, near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon in or order to uh, pull this landing off. Now, as, as you can imagine, the uh, environment around the moon is very challenging, and uh, for an imaging specialist like myself, it makes things very, very complicated. Extremes in heat and cold, for example. Uh, we deal with this on the space station as well. Uh, you, of course, are in a vacuum in space, so uh, you engineers uh, should know and understand and appreciate how difficult it would be to have electronics in the vacuum of space in the extreme cold and heat environment where there's no convective cooling unless you encapsulate that device. And if you encapsulate and pressure, pressurize that device, that's a new order of magnitude of complication as well. So. Uh, making an external camera work in space, particularly the space around the moon, is going to be very, very complicated. The radiation environment, and as I'll show you in a minute, uh, takes a toll on everybody and everything. So uh, you have all these particles shooting through the spacecraft, shooting through the humans on orbit, 
I've talked with and Dylan's talked with astronauts that have seen flashes in their eyes when a, when a um, particle blasts through their eyeball, for example. And uh, I can imagine that that would be a little disconcerting. But anyway, um, the uh, radiation takes its toll on the sensors. When we fly commercial cameras, uh, we begin to see the damage to those sensors over time. And they'll show up as, as dots, dead pixels in the camera. And that's in low Earth orbit, which is what most of our experience is going to be. Uh, there's very little known about some of the radiation environment that we're going to be at when we go halfway to the Lagrange point at the apogee of the orbit of this thing. Uh, lunar dust, as it turns out, um, right before Neil Armstrong uh, climbed back up the ladder, he had a little bit of room um, to uh, carry some more items, and so he scooped up some uh, lunar dust, some lunar dirt. That turned out to be very, very important because when they started looking at that lunar dust under a microscope, they discovered that it is very, has very sharp edges, almost like a fish hook. And those sharp edges, when they get into a mechanical device, they uh, can cause gum up, gumming up the works, as we would say in Alabama. Uh, so mitigating lunar dust is going to be a big challenge for us. All right, if we can bring the lights down, um, let your eyes adjust for a second. Everybody see those stars? Those are not stars. Those are uh, radiation hits to one of our red one, uh, one of our red cameras. Um, this is, uh, this one was up for two years. I believe this was a 6K version. 6K weapon, right. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. this was a 6K uh, heli uh, weapon. Um, by the way, certifying uh, something to fly in space called a weapon. Um, <laughs> n not a lot of fun, yeah. So uh, anyway, this is what that uh, radiation does to the sensors over a period of time. This was two years. So uh, in a well-lit scene uh, like this, for example, you wouldn't, may not see those damaged pixels, and they're not so apparent necessarily, depending on the subject matter. Uh, but here, uh, just to make it a little easier for you to see, all those little blue circles are dead pixels. Something I'd like to, to throw in. So on the space station, we, uh, our, our primary video camera currently is a XF305 by Canon. That's just kind of our day-to-day -day workhorse camera. We, we have the red camera as well to shoot you know, cinematic, cinematic type uh, shots, but we have to replace these cameras about every year because they just get, they get hammered after a while and it's a RGB star field in front of an image on there. And like Rodney's saying, in the light, you don't really see it that much, but as it starts to get darker, boy, it is, it is a, its own star field in, within itself. So what that means for us is we plan for a camera going back to the moon is um, it would be prohibitively expensive to try to radiation harden the cameras. And so uh, the interior and exterior cameras we would plan to replace and be, the exterior ones would have to be robotically replaceable. That's a significant thing. That's something that has to be engineered. It means that the mechanism that holds the camera has to have the uh, attachment point for the uh, robotic arm that will fly and that they would be able to um, take that camera, either throw it away or put it in an airlock and replace it with another one. So one of the things that I'm here today uh, to talk to all of you about is, uh, unlike the Apollo era, we, we're going to need some technical help. And there's some problems to solve. Uh, one of them is, is we would very much like to have a camera that has a pan-tilt function. But as I mentioned a moment ago, it's an extremely difficult environment to make a mechanical device. And so ideas that we've been kicking around uh, is maybe instead of one camera, we fly a, a, an arrangement of cameras and stitch the imagery together to virtually pan and tilt. Um, Dylan mentioned earlier the virtual reality uh, camera that um, uh, Felix, and, Felix Paul. and Paul are working with. Uh, that's a shot of it in the station. So a, a rig like that on the exterior of the space vehicle might be a way to solve that. The Problem is, is the computing uh, required to do all of that stitching has to be somewhere. And so um, there's heat. And so for every solution, there's three or four problems. And every time I throw out uh, a great idea, uh, very quickly an engineer kills it with reality. So <laughs> the other idea was, well, ho OK, fine. Let's overscan and have a 8K camera with a really good wide angle lens 
and then uh, we can extract uh, HD out of it and have virtual pan and tilt that way and maybe have two of them back to back. Those are just a couple of the ideas that we've talked about and hopefully your mind is spinning and you're thinking of something that we haven't thought about and can come back to us with um, some solutions. So uh, we see animation like this all the time and during the Apollo 11 anniversary I saw all sorts of documentaries and it occurred to me that the, um, the most, some of the most compelling footage is that third person view. So uh, Neil and Buzz, they set up a camera on a tripod and pointed it back at themselves to record them moving around on the, on the surface. And you know, NASA puts out these beautiful animations and uh, me being me, I look at this and say, well, how would I actually get that shot? And so uh, I was thinking, well, what if we had a robot that extricated itself from the lander and then moved out on the surface and turned itself around before those first steps. And then the engineers stepped in and told me 12 reasons why that would be very complicated. And uh, I was discussing this with a colleague of mine, Steve Long, who some of you in the room know. And uh, he came up with a really crazy idea. He said, well, why don't we just have the crew toss it out the hatch? And at first I thought, well, that's crazy. But then you do a little Googling and there's these, all these little robots and, and a little ball. And, and they can roll around and then turn back and look at the source. And so uh, I thought, you know, maybe uh, that would be something that we could do as a, uh, as a solution. And so uh, now I'm really hoping that your head, it, it, your, your mind is spinning and thinking about that because uh, there, there will be, I should mention, there's going to be lunar precursor robots. And uh, there is a chance that maybe one of them would be close enough to actually see uh, the craft land and we'd be able to watch that. We can't count on that, however, so I would very much like to have the crew have a robotic something and they toss that out. And you know maybe that would be an interesting project for an engineering master class to work on. And so I'm gonna talk to my colleagues back at headquarters and see if I can talk them into issuing a challenge, a formal challenge, uh, to see if, if this is something that we could actually do. What do you think? Is that a cool idea? Great idea. All right, good. Uh, this is, uh, there's, there's a young programmer who uh, took all of this audio and imagery and uh, telemetry, and he created a website uh, called Apollo in Real Time, apolloinrealtime.org. And so during July, uh, I turned this on, and I, uh, I promise you I was working but I would have this on, on a screen running in the background and it allowed me to sort of go back in time, 50 years, and I could listen to the loops and hear what Mission Control was doing. I could even listen to the astronauts and the crew, what they were doing inside the, the capsule uh, that wasn't, uh, all that audio necessarily wasn't being distributed back on Earth. And so uh, those recordings have all been synchronized and everything. One of the things that I worry about um, is uh, you know, how do we keep young people today engaged and interested in exploration in space? And um, they, they're used to a world where uh, things are available to them at an instant on uh, portable devices and so forth. And so I've been thinking if NASA would let us make some of this available in real time when we go back to the moon, wouldn't it be cool to have an app where you can click on it and you can hear what Mission Control is talking about among themselves, hear the crew and what they're saying, and if there's any imagery coming back, see all of that in real time. Um, for, for a variety of reasons, some of that may have to be delayed. Obviously, you want to be um, uh, sensitive to the uh, privacy of the crew and uh, also their safety. And, uh, you know, if we have a bad day, you don't want to hear what's going on in real time. That would be very disconcerting to the family and all the rest of us back on Earth. But maybe there's a way that some of this could be made available and maybe uh, uh, some smart programmer out there could put together a little app that uh, we would have on our whatever it w is that we'll have in 2024 and follow along in real time. So I've been doing a little bit of thinking about um, going forward to Mars, what would a human landing to Mars be like? Um, RF signals, depending on where Mars and the Earth are located, can take between four and 24 minutes to get back to Earth. And so um, 
in order, you know, we won't be getting live video live as you think of it as the events are happening. And the best analog for that uh, these days is, uh, is the Mars Curiosity mission. This is video of the, uh, the sound that was happening in real time synced later with the uh, five second per camera or five, five frame per second camera that was on the lander. And it's kind of interesting to watch this and think about what is a Mars landing going to be like. We are accelerating. Grid mode under our parachute is and descending. We are at 150 meters per second. Dynamics phase. Come back again with uh, wrist mode dynamics. Wrist mode is nominal. We are nine kilometers and descending. Eight is active. Valid range. That filter converged with a velocity correction of 0.7 meters a second. We've acquired the ground with the radar. Now an altitude of 8 kilometers. Speech has separated. Has separated. We've found we the ground. Expand tones due to earth occultation as expected. We're using by to prime the Emily engines in preparation for powered flight. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers and descending. Flight EDL, we've got some Tweedo warnings. It is in battle short mode, so it should power through them. Director Earth Communications at this time. We may have lost it already. We're down to 86 meters per second at an altitude of 4 kilometers and descending. We have lost act we've lost tones from Earth at this time. This is expected. Uh, we are continuing on Odyssey telemetry. Ground solution equals minus 10.8 meters, vertical velocity of minus 82.8 meters per second. We are priming target start enabled, standing by for batch shell separation. Signal Odyssey is still strong. We are in powered flight. Yes. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. About 70 meters per second. Signal to us. Control the air. Down to 50 meters per second. 500 meters in altitude. Yes. Standing by for sky crane. Constant velocity accordion nominal. Altitude error 5.9 meters. We found a nice flat place. We're coming in ready for sky crane. Down to 10 meters per second. 40 meters altitude. Sky crane has started. Descending at about 0.75 meters per second as expected. Expecting bridal cut shortly. Single us, you remain strong. Tango Delta nominal. Oh. Yeah, uh, you do a calm configuration. Rhythm is stable. Rhythm is stable. Oh, UHF is good. Yes. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on live. <laughs> That to me is JPL at his finest hour showing off. You know, we've got video uh, as a spacecraft hovers in Mars. Um, okay, so um, we have a surprise for you. Uh, we've been kind of holding out um, to Thank surprise you. all of you. Good. Station, this is Simpty. How do you hear? Space Station. So, good morning. This is Dylan Mathis with uh, Rodney Grubbs from Marshall. We just wanted to, to uh, take a little bit of your time to talk about imagery from the Space Station. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate you all on a spectacular EVA last week. Outstanding job. Um, but our first question starting out is, what images from the space program inspired you when you were younger?
Well, one of the images that is most striking in my mind is the iconic Earthrise photo that Bill Anders took on the Apollo 8 mission. And that was a very important image to me because, first of all, it really was quite pivotal for several reasons in terms of shaping the environmental movement and also in making people start to think about our our significance within the solar system and within the universe and really how insignificant we are as humans and on our planet Earth and also how fragile the planet Earth was, how thin that boundary of the atmosphere is, how we really needed to protect it and how we really do only have this one true home. And that image really did put that thought into people's minds, some of which for the first time, to help start that environmental movement, people start thinking about the planet and the conservation in general and all of the resources back on Earth that we really need to make sure that we protect. And for me, something that stands out are the IMAX films of my childhood. So things like The Dream is Alive, Hail Columbia. Um, I grew up in a small town. We didn't have an IMAX theater, theater or anything. So I actually saw my first IMAX film when I went to space camp. And it completely blew my mind. Um, and I was enthralled with it. Just the fact that, you know, with the wraparound screen, you felt completely immersed. And every year that I went back, to space camp, I saw the same movies, but I never got tired of them. In, in this uh, recent past here on the ISS, we've done a number of spacewalks, as you know, very high profile one last week, and one of the iconic images that uh, people often associate with NASA is the picture of Bruce McCandless and the MMU, the man maneuvering unit, our archaic uh, nomenclature now, but, uh, but nevertheless a picture of him in that what otherwise I think commonly people would assume is a jetpack. And uh, that is a really interesting and ironic image because it was actually one of the few times that a spacewalk was, uh, was conducted untethered because actually when we do spacewalk now we're always tethered and so that it has become an iconic image of spacewalking and what it means to be an astronaut, to be out there uh, alone and unafraid in a spacesuit with a jetpack on. What can we do in an age where so many people seem to be skeptical about what they see and hear to assure them that what they're seeing from us as, as you explore space is actually real? And uh, can you also tell us where over the Earth you are about right now? Over. Well, I think uh, it's our duty to continue to just produce imagery of all types, video imagery and still imagery, and we'll do it with uh, integrity. And, uh, and the more we put out there, the more real it becomes to everyone. And I completely agree with Drew, and to add to that, I think adding the personal stories behind the images can do so much to really bring it home and the emotion that we felt at the time um, kind of shows that there was more to it than just the image captured. So I know you guys occasionally get a little bit of downtime, not a whole lot, um, but when you do, uh, are you able to watch movies and that type of thing? Over. Yeah, we can. We can watch movies. We have group dinners and that kind of thing. But I think one of the things that we prefer to do in our free time is really look out the window. And that goes right along with the photographs and the videos. We have, of course, this magnificent view from the cupola, which is a series of six windows around us and one on the top where we can see the Earth from many different vantage points. We have other windows throughout the space station as well. And as you can imagine, that view never gets old. It is really so incredible. I've only been up here less in a month now and every time I go to the cupola and look back at the earth and see how vibrant the colors are 
how the layers of the atmosphere are so poignant and it it really is interesting. I don't think it feels the same as any picture, any picture I've seen or any video I've seen either. Just, but what we can do, taking pictures, taking videos of what we're looking at is allowing us to share it with everybody else that isn't as fortunate as us to be here. So I see you have several cameras floating there with you. Um, a still camera, a digital cinema camera, and a video camera. As we start planning for the Boots on the Moon mission and start thinking about uh, pulling that, uh, that miracle off, if we could only take one camera, if they say we only have room to take one camera, would you take a video camera or a digital still camera? Over. You know, going back to the spacewalks we did recently, we're often uh, faced with that decision. Do we take a still camera or do we take uh, a GoPro camera with us? Some, sometimes we take both, um, but often that's not, con not con uh, convenient. Um, and the, we'll make similar decisions in the, in the future, but I think if you take a really high uh, quality, high definition video camera, you can always turn that into still images later. So, you know, if you had to, I think, that's the image that you want to capture that really brings it to life. So in modern technology, we have new technologies like augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, can you talk a little bit about what some of these new technologies might enable us to do that was never imagined in the Apollo era and uh, how that might help take the rest of us back here on Earth along for the ride with the explorers? Over. I want to go back to one of the other questions. I think there's a, a couple different ways that we use things like virtual reality and augmented reality on board the International Space Station. One uh, is training. Uh, when we train for, um, actually, we, we, I mentioned that, that jet pack in the event that we were to lose contact with the space station and our, there was a problem with our tether and we had to rescue ourselves with a jet pack, we actually have a simulation that we practice before we go on a spacewalk of uh, practicing using that equipment. And we have a virtual reality headset that we use for that. So we use it in training. We also use it in, uh, or intend to uh, use something called uh, HoloLens, which is a payload that we're exploring how it could use to help us operationally doing maintenance tasks where the ground can see what we're seeing. We often use over the shoulder camera views with just one of these XF305s like uh, we demonstrated here, where the ground team is looking at what we're doing and provides that overwatch and that extra set of eyes when something floats away or if there's something we've missed and we often uh, need their assistance. With the augmented reality style, they'll be able to see exactly where we're looking, potentially provide overlays and direct instructions, point things out to us. And then something else that I've n noticed being up here is that uh, it would be, you know, when we go further and further, we go onto the moon and we go onto the Mars, the ability to escape your environment, you know, right now we have this beautiful window, we can look at the Earth, but when we get further and further away from the Earth, we'll need that immersive technology, virtual reality to reproduce the sensation of being at home and being in a different environment when we no longer can just look out the window and see the earth below us. Yeah, in addition to that, we actually are using some of that at NASA already. I was a subject for a payload I think that was already being developed in looking at psychological support for astronauts on exactly that kind of mission that Drew was talking about. And my mom had actually delivered some test messages to help the group with it where it was a virtual reality experience, but people from my family or friends had actually had real recording greetings in their voices. And although it was all done with avatars in different environments that I could explore, it still had a bit of home where I could get a present or get a message from somebody else along the way. So I think there could be a lot of psychological value in that as well. And some of the payloads that we're working on right now up here, for example, the ISS experience, will allow us to share this opportunity, this incredible opportunity that we have up here as astronauts, 
with all of the world in exactly that manner. And I've been fortunate enough to see some of these previous products and then also a, a test version or a trailer for the ISS experience. And it is completely immersive. You feel like you're right here on the space station. I saw it for the first time before I came up here and it was an incredible feeling. Astronauts that had been up here while it was, were, was being filmed and then saw it on the ground felt like they were right back up here. It is a very, very powerful tool and it's very exciting to me because it will allow us to share this exceptional experience with all of our family, our friends, and with the entire planet. So, uh, pardon the expression, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and ask you big picture wise, what is it we're doing on space station that's gonna help us get to the moon and Mars? What things are we learning? I would say one of the most important types of studies that we're doing right now are studies of human research on our own selves. We are learning the effects of microgravity on the human body and how we can mitigate those effects and what countermeasures we can develop to make sure that people can be sustained in microgravity for long periods of time. We want to make sure that once we land on Mars, we're going to have the strength and ability to actually explore the planet once we get there. And then as well, the psychological fortitude to undergo such a long trip away from all of our support structure. So to me, that's one of the main reasons that we're, uh, or the main ways that we study that. There's also technology development for life support systems that we'll need for long duration, as well as just testing out the operational environment and learning how we can best operate our sparing posture, how we can do repairs and things like that. So it's a really fascinating time to be aboard the International Space Station. So I've always wondered, what are those first moments as you start? And you know, the International Space Station is also a testbed for commercial uh, partnership as well as international partnership. And, and in my opinion, the, the most important is international partnership. And that's a key feature of the Artemis program and our return to the moon is that will be a, a, a commercial and international partnership. And, uh, and this is where we're testing those uh, those processes, those uh, those concepts, and we're building the relationships now uh, between the space agencies that will be essential to get us there. So I've wondered, when you uh, go EVA for the first time and you step out, um, how do you separate all your training and all of the time that it took to prepare for that moment from just the awesomeness of it? Does it take your breath away like we could imagine, or is it terrifying or parts of all of the above? Over. Well, that's an interesting timing for that question, since that, exactly that happened to me just last Friday was my very first spacewalk. And I would say it is a combination of everything that you said. We have so many hours of rigorous training on the ground where we have rehearsed everything that we do in the suits and using the tools that we use all underwater and training in Houston. So we have this muscle memory, which is really nice to rely on in that kind of environment. So when I went out the hatch for the first time and Christina was already outside, she was waiting for me, and I looked down and I saw my boots, only my boots hanging out and then the earth below. And it was such a spectacular image. And we tell ourselves that, we tell each other that before spacewalks as well, to just make sure that we actually take a moment to look back at the earth, to enjoy and appreciate the magnitude of what we're doing and really just take a moment to appreciate all of that. And I think it's easy for all of us to get very caught up in our work and make sure, you know, we want to make sure that we are getting the task done and accomplishing the mission, but what we try to do is balance both. Christina, Jessica, Drew, we're uh, about out of time, but we wanted to take a moment to thank you so much for your time out of your busy day. And uh, we will hope to see you back in Houston uh, one of these days sometime soon. Godspeed. speaking to you guys today.
I'm just going to let that stay for a minute. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all the participants at the CINTI conference. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Back to work. I, I want to thank a lot of people who uh, have really worked hard to pull off that little miracle. Every time we do a live shot from space, uh, I just um, am in awe that all of that works. And we're using a lot of the technology and standards that people in this room developed. So thank you very much. So I wanted to um, give a little, a few moments to um, entertain questions. We've already talked a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that we face, and uh, we are hoping that industry can help us capture the imagery for the filmmakers 50 years after the next moon landing, so they can do the same kind of things that we heard about today, where they're telling the stories of uh, our exploration and this time, hopefully, going back to the moon to stay and then on to Mars. So we'll take a few questions. Hi, James Snyder, Library of Congress. Um, great presentation. Needless to say, really enjoyed it. Um, however, having been involved with some of the data preservation challenges of previous missions, including the loss of certain data tapes, um, I'm wondering, uh, what NASA and its partners are doing to preserve the data that is being generated, to preserve the data that will be generated, to make sure that we don't have another Apollo where we have lost the data tapes and the original video that came back from the moon, which was the miracle that you guys talked about today, but right. the original slow scan is gone because they recycled the data tapes. Right. Um, and can you give me an idea, has that been part of the planning as an archivist? Um, I know that that planning needs to be from the beginning of planning if it's done properly. Has that been done? How is that being addressed? Yes, for the reasons that you cited, NASA is very sensitive about that. Um, the short answer is, is big servers and cloud to uh, have multiple um, copies of everything and glacial storage copies of everything. But uh, if you're familiar with the concept that Vince Cerf has about bit rot, one of the things I worry about is it's one thing to have the data, it's another entirely to be able to interpret it and use it 50 years hence when operating systems and everything changes. So uh, there is a, uh, a working group, an international working group working on international standards for data archiving and uh, NASA is planning on participating in that and has uh, people that participate in the writing of those standards and it involves not only capturing the data, but uh, the um, operating systems and the other code that is required to interpret that data. And please tell me you're hashing everything. Uh, that's, that's beyond my expertise. So. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Uh, as a person who's been involved occasionally with live broadcasts and live events, I just take my hat off to you guys for pulling this off with such a great straight face and <laughs> knocking us dead with this. Can you give us a little bit of behind the scenes information about what kind of images were acquired, how they actually transported, how they got here, what the delays were and the things that... Yeah, I'll go very quickly and, and talk about something that we just did that is new. Um, so uh, there are uh, tracking data relay satellites around the Earth and uh, the signals from the station as it's orbiting bounce around those and they land in New Mexico and then go to the Marshall Space Flight Center and Johnson Space Center. And uh, that was shot with a Canon 305, right Dylan? Mm -hmm. And used an MPEG-4 commercial encoder, I believe. And, right. uh, and then that's mucked together with all the other telemetry coming from the ISS. When it hits the ground at JSC and Marshall Space Flight Center, they, we, they split out all of the headers and get back to the transport stream. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we had two modes of transport, and the primary was using AWS Elemental Cloud uh, Media Services. You're going to hear a little bit more about this afternoon. And uh, that's what's a little bit new. Normally, we would uh, just rely on a satellite return, but we couldn't figure out how to get a satellite dish and the live video back here. 
And so uh, we decided uh, we want to try something a little bit different, and uh, AWS Elemental was gracious enough to offer their services. So uh, we routed the video to Encompass in Atlanta, and then from there, media servers and cloud magic that you'll hear more about got it all here. And I believe the latency was around five, five and a half seconds, something right. like that. And, and getting it from the space station is about 650 milliseconds by the time it hits the decoder. Um, but there's a lot of steps that are involved in doing that and a lot of magic that happens. And just the fact that we could do this here and talk with them to me just amazes me. It's mm -hmm. uh, phenomenal. Yeah. So Mike, Mike Palmer at MassTech, in the, in the early 90s, we really appreciated the move from field sequential video <laughs> to, to NTSC coming, coming back down from, from the shuttle. And we didn't realize immediately that what was at the end of the cable in the shuttle was a Sony Handycam. Mm. Um, in the middle of my first interview that I did with the shuttle, four minutes in, we lost video, it went to black, and the audio continued, which, as a producer and director of that shot, made my heart leave my chest. <laughs> um, and we found out later the problem was that the tape was left in the camera and it simply timed out. Yeah. What type of uh, unintended consequences have you found in the use of off-the-shelf equipment uh, in space? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, I have to think of a few. Uh, well, one, one of the things, uh, just to give you an example, with, with the, the cameras that we use, yes, they, we, we tout, yes, we're using COTS cameras, but because of a camera needing to be left on for an extended period of time mm. and not time out, we work with the manufacturers to change the firmware so that those things stay on and you don't have that time out uh, type scenario where your heart comes out of your chest. I can only imagine what that must have felt like. Yeah, I believe Nikon actually has a NASA setting now for that. Um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the other things is, is a viewfinder that you put your eye up against is totally impractical in space for the reasons that you just saw with everything floating around. So we've learned that uh, the bigger uh, the monitor, uh, the better. And uh, the bigger the sensor, of course, the shallower the depth of field. So we had to really train the crew uh, to be really precise when they're using a digital cinema camera to get everything in focus because uh, the smaller sensors and the video cameras are a lot more forgiving than a digital cinema camera. Pat Griffiths, Simpty President. Once again, thank you for pulling this off. We were all on pins and needles hoping it would happen, so <laughs> awesome. Um, my question is, the sun is 1.6 billion candelas per meter squared. You've talked a lot about more spatial resolution, which of course we love. What about HDR? We do have standards, by the way, for that. Yes. I, I, I was told there'd be no math in this. Uh... <laughs> right. Go ahead. So uh, I'm glad you asked that question because we were doing some modeling recently where we were looking for camera locations for the gateway the part of the spacecraft that we showed you that'll be around the moon. And uh, we were, you know, we can be very precise, tell them the lens and the s sensor and so forth, and they have a CAD model of what the vehicle is going to look like. So they can tell you exactly what kind of view we, we would get with that combination. And we were getting pretty excited about it until I said, well, what about the sun? You haven't added the sun yet. And uh, one of the challenges that we have is when uh, the vehicle has Orion on board, the back of Orion has to face the sun all the time. And so a camera location that is looking right down the spacecraft at where the Orion will be coming in uh, will look great until it's pointed straight at the sun. And so, uh, you know, uh, those of you out there think you deal with high contrast, well, let's go out in space <laughs> and, and uh, you, you know, uh, get the uh, aperture right uh, when you're pointed right at the sun, but what you want to see is in total, in complete, utter blackness. And so uh, HDR is something that uh, we've talked a lot about and that we hope to take advantage of, and uh, it's very much on my mind for that reason. We have some expertise, so we're here to help you. Well, thank, thank you. you. I'm counting on it. Hi. My question is, what do you estimate the probability being that we will actually make it to the moon by 2024. Politically or technically? <laughs> technically. Um, it's going to be sporty, I'm not going to lie. Uh, NASA's doing things a little bit different than it did in the Apollo days, where we designed the rockets pretty much ourselves and then told industry, build me five more of those. We don't have time to go through all of that procurement process and so forth. 
So this time around, they're uh, doing announcements and saying, uh, hey, we kind of want a lander, and these are the basic things that we want to do. Hey, industry uh, and companies that you all know about and hear about are interested in participating with NASA, and it's going to be more of a partnership than, than before. But if everything goes right, we get all the funding that we want, it's still going to be very sporty because yeah. there's going to be a lot of things that, uh, that will fly with crew on board for the first time. There won't be uh, a, uh, a practice mission for the human landing system. When it goes to the moon, it'll be going with crew for the first time on its first maiden voyage to pull that 2024 uh, off. Uh, also, because of that orbit, once they get to the moon, it's not going to be a photo op and bounce around for a while and jump back and go back. They're going to have to be there for six and a half days because their lifeboat is, is heading back to the Lagrange point. And so they're going to be there for a while. So there's a lot of techno technological hurdles and there's a lot of good people working hard along with industry to figure it out. So that was a long-winded way to say, uh, I certainly hope we can pull it off. Isn't it worth trying, though? Hi, I'm Bill Miller. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in your presentation that uh, one of the things you were thinking about to uh, uh, do a virtual pan tilt zoom was to move a viewport around on a very high resolution image to derive stuff from it. We have a SIMPTI standard that describes how to describe that viewport. The question is, do you need more? That, that standard is currently under review. So what would be helpful for us in reviewing it is knowing what the original size image, the limits of the original size image you need would be so that we can possibly uh, rework that standard to give you the number of bits you need to be able to describe a huge viewport. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously I'm not gonna be able to answer all your questions there, but I certainly know the right people to put in touch with you and it sounds like perfect timing to have that conversation. So if you wanna reach me later, we'll get our contact information and. I'll get the smart people back in Houston in touch with you, and hopefully they can give you the information specifically that you're be, asking about. Be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Merrill Weiss. Uh, you've uh, mentioned a number of times the uh, orbit that will uh, be used around the moon. Could you explain the reason for that briefly? Well, um, believe it or not, I'm not a uh, orbital mechanics specialist, so I can, I, I can do my best to interpret what my Bachelor of Arts from University of Alabama brain interpreted. <laughs> but uh, one is, is that uh, the way that orbit is going to work, it gives you nearly constant communications back to Earth because it is, uh, it, I wish I had a visual, but Instead of going around the moon uh, relative to the Earth, it's going around the moon perpendicular to the Earth. And so uh, there's only a couple of eclipses where it's not in constant communication. So that was one reason. The other is the Lagrange point gives you uh, a, ability to have that parking orbit that doesn't require as much energy once you get there. And um, the third reason is, is it happens to be a, a really good launching point for a crewed mission to Mars, which is the ultimate goal. Did I pull that off? Rod Evenson <laughs> was the name. Um, you were talking earlier about uh, the radiation damage to uh, camera sensors. Now, I'm remembering that uh, in the Apollo missions, uh, photographic film was stored in a lead pig mm -hmm. uh, to keep it from being exposed by uh, cosmic rays and such. Um, certainly, the idea of shielding an entire camera that way is, is not practical, but what about the sensor itself? And uh, I, I'd had some experience uh, in this area. When I worked at Hanford, uh, we had a camera looking into uh, an area between the, in the annulus of a nuclear a, a radiation waste tank radioactive materials waste tank. The camera was shielded with a half inch of lead. Uh, there was also a video camera which was intended for use in uh, uh, nuclear environments. Uh, the shielding was sufficient for about 20 minutes using a, a slide duplication film which had an exposure index of about five. Uh, and that's... <laughs> And, and that's as long as you could keep it in there before it fogged. But 
Yeah, so shielding with lead, you know, the, the challenge for us is, you know, when I talk to uh, the engineers building the spacecraft about flying cameras, um, you know, every ounce uh, to orbit is extremely precious. It costs 10 times as much money to put something into lunar orbit as it does um, uh, orbit around the Earth. And so the idea of casing, uh, encasing, you know, the camera and, or, or surrounding the images in lead, uh, what, what they hear is lots and lots of mass that they have to get up there. So the, it's the trade, right? And so um, we, we, it's a long subject for a different paper for a different time, but uh, hopefully by making the cameras replaceable, we'll have an opportunity to try different technologies and find the one that works the best and behaves the best. Thank you all very much for um, your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, very, very, very much, Rodney and Dylan, for sharing Project Artemis with us and the incredible surprise of the live video uh, from the ISS from the astronauts Jessica, Christina, and Drew. Um, what a great way to show all of us engineers at SEMTI what, uh, some applications for what we do. Um, let's see. Oh, and we've also heard now how important it is to share the personal stories behind the images. So it's not just the images, but the stories. So keep it up, guys. Thank you again, Rodney, Dylan. Thank you.